So first of all, let me introduce um, Eduardo Lalo, who is many things actually. He's written novels, he's also an essayist, he's an artist who works across a wide range of um, media, uh, from drawing to video, he has made uh, films. He was born in Cuba, but is a professor of literature at the University of Puerto Rico. And um, among his um, novels are Uselessness, like La Inutilidad from 2004, Simon from 2015, and most recently, Historia the UK. And I want specifically to mention Simon because for that novel, he was um, awarded the prestigious. Uh, International Novel Prize, the Romulo Gallegos uh, Prize, which has been awarded before to the likes of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, Eduardo has lived in many different countries, and I know he's also studied the fi he studied fine arts in Paris, so I assume that he speaks French. Um, and the theme of, I should perhaps say something about the theme uh, of this, uh, this uh, panel ethics, which I think is uh, perhaps overdue in the humanities, in the social sciences. We have had discussions about ethical practice for quite a long time, but at a time when many universities are trying to impose uh, ethical procedures from a very top-down administrative uh, perspective which is sometimes completely unsuitable for the kind of writing that we try to do and which often come from models drawn out of the medical sciences then those kinds of conversations it seems to me are more important than ever so i really look forward to hearing um, about what the speakers have to say on the subject and on their writing practice so eduardo yeah, good afternoon I'm very happy to be here at uh, Oxford uh, at the Center of uh, Writing here. And I would like first to thank uh, Catherine Collins for inviting me to, to this forum. I wrote a small text to, in some way, try to approach the problem of biography in what uh, some people call the global south. I come from Puerto Rico, an island nation in the Caribbean, the oldest colony in the world. What is, what is hidden or constrained in the, or contained in the, what is hidden or, or contained in the problematic denomination Global South has its origins in the sea and its lands, whose name, whose um, names and cultures were obliterated by the, by the start in 1492 of an extensive period of Western conquest and colonization. From my country, Puerto Rico, which is the only one in Latin America, in Latin America conquered twice, by the Spanish in 1508 and by the Americans in 1898, this process is still ongoing. Conquest and colonization have their own eccentric geopolitics. A member of an island nation belonging to the Northern Hemisphere is invited to speak in a colloquium about the Global South. The South, quote unquote, has ceased to be a geographical category and, is, and it's turned into a set word that hides poverty and injustice and that also possibilitates the invisibilization of individuals and peoples. When I was 14 or 15 years old, I had to take a world history course. The book was a textbook written in English that most of the Spanish-speaking students read with difficulty. The teacher was an American priest that saw his role as an emissary of Western culture in backward, backward lands and who had no intention no interest in knowing or understanding them better. In chapter after chapter, um, the author of the book spoke about the universal, quote unquote, Sumerians and Egyptians, Greeks and Romans, the origins of Christian Europe, the Dark Ages and the Renaissance, the European discovery of the world, 
industrial age and modernity. These were, there, there were wars and great statesmen, men of letters and science, but there was a flaw in this universal history. Nothing in the many pages of that book and in the classes of our teacher included me for the world that I knew. But I realized soon that I was mistaken. There was one mention of my region, even if the author did not refer to it by name. In shores and beaches of the ones I knew, centuries ago, what the book called the Age of Discovery had begun. Extermination of indigenous peoples or slavery were mentioned in passing, and then there was silence, an uncanny void. I recall that even at that moment, I realized that there was something terribly, terribly wrong. I also knew that these were, that there were little, there, sorry, I also knew that there were, was little space for protestations. Any questioning of the course of the teacher would have elicited an answer that was, that was both hated and feared. World history is about great events and peoples, and there was nothing of that sort in Puerto Rico or the Caribbean. It is possible that I first primitively encountered the desire to be a writer in that balmy and claustrophobic classroom in which world history, quote unquote, had no place for people like me. From then on, I began to understand that writing is rewriting, that the objective of writing is not repetition but confrontation, that the purpose, purpose of the whole body of work is to provide with footnotes and marginal quote-unquote annotations to the insular self-complacency com of the West. This self-complacency is everywhere and I will provide to conclude an example. When I arrived at Oxford a month ago, I went to visit the Pitt Rivers Museum and the Museum of Natural History. Ch children are everywhere on the latter one. And one of the unquestionable, st questionable stars of the show is the dodo. In the case where its remains and reconstruction are exhibited, one can read, and I quote, the dodo is the most famous of all the creatures to have become extinct in historical times. The remains of the dodo at Oxford are one of the greatest treasures of the museum. End of quote. The very logo of the museum, a stylized and playful rendition of the bird, attests this relevance. A few meters away from its case, on the second floor of the Big River Museum, one can find an enormous display of the weapons of the world. On one side, one can see the swords and logons, the shields and claws that were the weapons of all colonized peoples. On the other, firearms of the world of the West are displayed. No comment is made, no relationship is established. There is not a single mention of conquest, colonization, slavery, or genocide. This gentle, quote unquote, dodo that all children in England probably know is not what it pretends to be. Research done by the University of Warwick shows that the, and I quote, the Oxford dodo was shot in the neck and back of the head with a chaplain, end of quote. The dodo's crystal case in Oxford's Museum of Natural History holds not only physical remains and a reconstruction of the bird, it is the scene of a crime. Official, canonical, quote-unquote, world history is a defiguration. In the global south, in the many lands of, of coloniality, there are innumerable dodos, many cry, crimes left without words. To write is to rewrite everywhere, but especially so in the lands, le in the lands left out or marginalized in quote-unquote world history. 
that writing that confronts history and power, that comes from the depths of personal and collective pain, wants to prove with all its might that nothing, really nothing, is, is as dead, is dead as a dodo. The crimes of history and the world history that I spoke of is another crime, will be expressed with new, unthought of words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo. So I think we'll take each speaker in turn and then questions at the end. Right, so we now have um, Elika Bommel. Many of you, most of you will know Elika. She's a professor of world literature in English uh, here at the University of Oxford. She's also director of the Oxford Center for Life Writing. Um, she's one of the absolute uh, groundbreaking figures in the world of, uh, in the field of post-colonial literature. And very importantly, she's also a writer in her own right. She has uh, published several novels uh, to great acclaim, Screens Against the Sky, um, recently The Shouting in the Dark, a few years ago, Nile Baby. She's also published short story collections, uh, Shamila and Other Portraits, uh, To the Volcano and Other Stories. And her academic writing has also been uh, prize-winning, for example, Indian Arrivals Networks of British Empire, which was published in the same year as uh, Shouting in the Dark. I never know uh, quite Elika, how Elika does it. She, she seems to publish uh, books at breathtaking speed. Post-colonial poetics, most recently, uh, was published also to great acclaim, and I would recommend anyone who hasn't yet read post-colonial poetics to read it. It's an absolutely uh, groundbreaking book. She's also known for um, biography of Nelson Mandela, and very importantly, I think she's also uh, a model for many of us in terms of bridging academic writing and the academic world with the world of creating writing, creative writing, and bringing uh, the world of uh, writing closer to academia. There seems to be uh, a never-ending uh, series of really exciting events with writers who come to Oxford uh, to be in conversation with Elika in very, very inspiring ways. This uh, bridging of uh, academic writing with um, a broader audience and the world of creating writing really uh, no one does this uh, better than Elika. So um, I'm not sure which project she's going to talk about today but we'll be yeah, very sure. Thank you very much and very generous introductions are quite hard to live up to. <laughs> um, so it, it's a great uh, a privilege to be on this on the on this panel and to be talking about um, inscribing biographies in global South history. Um, I'm probably going to take a slightly uh, different focus than we've heard about from either Eduardo or Shapria, although it is related. And I think what I'm going to say is very closely related to what you were saying about. Um, you know, the creative writing, um, the, the work of fiction, creative non-fiction, as, as it were, kind of grappling with those yawning gaps in, 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 in world history, Eduardo. Um, so, I, I have some thoughts, observations, they're not that coherently strung together, um, and I end quite open-endedly um, to, to, to give room for sort of conversation across the panel and then also where we have discussion um, with, with, with everyone at the end of the panel. Um, and I'm going to, to address this idea of inscribing biography by taking throughout, implicitly and explicitly, um, life writing, biography and autobiography as a kind of interpretive tool, a kind of, you know, um, I mean, another way of going about history. Um, so I'm, I'm not that interested in, as it were, inserting biography into history or Global South history. I'm interested more in life writing as a way of, of thinking history from the South. 
So we need new names and forms to write the self within literary languages that are northern in provenance. Nearly all the dominant world languages, in fact all, I would venture to say, are northern in provenance, whether we're thinking Mandarin or Spanish or English. The new project that I want to sort of touch on briefly in, this, in these remarks um, looks at how southern worlds, and I explicitly don't say global southern worlds, how southern worlds might be imagined on their own terms and in relation to each other. To date, northern stories and histories have moulded global perceptions of southern worlds. The further south, the more mythical and distorting these northern tales have been. And I want to ask in this project how southern writing and storytelling, both settler and indigenous, offers countervailing perspectives to these northern imaginative norms, including the norm, the concept of the global south, which is so homogenizing and top-down and northern in construction. So how do southern lands, peoples, communities, writers see themselves on their own terms? And as I already anticipated, Life writing, biography and autobiography, I want to suggest, has offered a very effective ways of asserting new forms and resisting northern forms and northern languages in inscribing the South. A key text still for me in, in thinking through some of this is Paul Carter's writing um, The Road to Botany Bay in which he talks about writing, in that case in particular travel writing, as a new way of situating oneself or oneself in a new environment, locating your story, drawing, or even speaking, singing your story. So in response to the question on uh, the poster for today, how can life stories from the global south enhance our understanding of southern histories, cultures, and lives, my provisional response would be, they are a vital form. Okay, We need to explore how, but they are, I want to recognize, a vital form, perhaps the most vital in understanding southern histories, cultures, and lives. And I want to illustrate this with a few brief examples. Um, first, beginning with stories that have been projected from the north onto the south to illustrate what I'm trying to work against. And then to look briefly um, at, at, very, very briefly, at stories of the South about the South to demonstrate the kind of shift of imaginative and ethical axis that I'm keen to explore. And this image of uh, four indigenous women, Australian women, collectively talking out and drawing a narrative of their country captures something of this shift of axis. So my, my first example of, of a northern tale projected from the north onto the south in order to understand something of the south is, um, is the example of Rudyard Kipling's Kim, which um, is a subtext to so many writings of adventure and travel writing by um, northern adventurers, British in the main, in narrating their southern experiences. Um, it was the, um, I've been doing some research into polar exploration recently, and I was uh, fascinated and in a way appalled to discover that it was the text that was most read by Scott's party um, in their hut um, before, you know, before they, they, they went Scott and the, the other three went out to, um, to the north, to, sorry, to the South Pole. Um, so you know, nearly all the men in the hut, including, as Scott named them, the men, um, as, as against the scientists and the leaders, um, nearly all the men read 
him to understand something of what they were doing there on their polar exploration, on their polar journey. Now, Amundsen, by contrast, who of course made it to the, the South Pole first, had consulted with indigenous Sami people in kind of setting up the law and the knowledge, the framework to, through which to understand his journey to the South Pole. And he was advantaged by that. So the story is a very sort of you know, basic example, really. The story of, of northern adventuring, by which I mean, of course, Kim is a story of, you know, um, this Anglo-Irish boy in, 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 in India, but it's, it has northern provenance insofar as Kipling was writing from a northern perspective, but it is something that has shaped understanding of travel, European travel in the south. Um, and against this, um, to, 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 to try to kind of sh to, sh to shift the axis, to try to see what has been um, conventionally cast as otherwise widdershins, upside down, down under, weird, strange, against nature. Um, some of those terms are taken from, you know, the uh, Cook's journals, for example, in in um, trying to understand his his southern uh, journey, um, to try to, to 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 turn those terms around, um, I have been um, doing some work on it's in anthropology actually on how indigenous peoples of um, Western Australia, of Southern Africa, and of South South. Argentina and Chile was now Argentina and Chile understood how they read the constellations of the southern skies. And what I've been fascinated to discover, um, there's so much more to say about this, but this is as, as, again just a sort of taste to, to illustrate how I'm trying to, to kind of think differently, think south in this new project. What I've been fascinated to discover is that across those vast distances, um, southern peoples have seen similar patterns in the Milky Way, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in particular, interestingly, in the dark spaces of the Milky Way, and have associated those spaces with certain you know, myths of you know, fertility gods which they have used, they've used those myths to, um, to mark, to anticipate, to mark um, harvest time and time of planting. Um, and I'll end now, I think, but, but I think it's w w what we have there, if we, th if we think about those commonalities across the South, peoples who um, would have had no knowledge of each other, I think what we start to see is, um, is a way of pushing against um, this dominant, powerful, um, you know, we might have said in the 1980s, you know, monologic stories that have been used to, as it were, process, understand, but also exterminate southern peoples and southern worlds. That's it. Thank you so much, Elike. Uh, we're now moving on to Johnny Steinberg, who uh, is a professor of African studies here at the University of Oxford. He's my former colleague at the African Studies Center. He's uh, recently returned to Oxford from uh, a year at the University of Yale. So Johnny's work is um, very difficult to classify because, again, it uh, spans across many disciplines and styles of writing. But uh, he puts uh, many of us to shame with the breathtaking speed at which he publishes books. Most recently, uh, he's published A Man of Good Hope, which is a biography of a Somali man who came to um, South Africa as a refugee um, after 15 years or so of flight through the Horn of Africa. Um, 
he's also um, written many other books, and I guess Johnny's work is also grounded in biographies, grounded his individual stories, through which he says something um, much broader and much more critical about the state of post-apartheid South Africa, uh, but he's also written on uh, the aftermath of Liberia's, uh, Liberia's civil war and some of the questions that the civil war has raised about uh, exile, trans transitional justice. He's um, received many prizes for his books. Um, two of his books have won South Africa's um, most uh, prestigious non-fiction literary award, the Sunday Times Allen Patton Prize. He has also received uh, one of the inaugural Wyndham Campbell Prizes. Johnny has, among other things, worked as a journalist. He's written scripts for TV drama. He's been a consultant to the South African government on criminal justice. Uh, and more generally, his work is concerned with um, criminal justice, um, the country, South Africa's transition to democracy. He's written about prison, the prison, the farm, the police, um, and the clinic. And now Johnny has another project which he's going to tell us about. Thanks very much, Ellen. Hello, everybody. Um, I, I, thanks. Sure. Um, I want to speak to, particularly to the subtitle of this session, um, on ethics and the writing process in, in writing Southern Lives, and, and do so just by way of example in the form of a, of a very acute dilemma that I faced in writing about a Southern man's life, um, a, a dilemma which had me put down the book I was working on for two years before picking it up again and deciding that I'd resolved the, the dilemma, which I'm obviously not the last judge of. But, but let me, I, I just want to take 10 minutes going through the story and the, the dilemma, and at the end saying something more general about what it might say to the question of biography. Um, the, the genesis of the project was reading a newspaper article at the end of 2011 in South Africa's Sunday Times about two men who had just walked out of prison on parole, having spent 19 years in jail for a murder. Uh, by the time they walked out of prison, it was widely regarded that they were innocents, although they were hadn't shown their innocence in the court. And, and, and the story briefly was this. They were, they were both from a, a small rural town in the Free State province of South Africa called Bethlehem. They were very ordinary young men. They were in their early 20s. Uh, they had very rudimentary education. One worked as a cashier in the supermarkets. The other was a welder's assistant. They all apartheid security police. This is in April 1992. Broke down the doors of their houses, dragged them out, um, and accused them of having been involved in a murder that had taken place on the outskirts of Bethlehem that afternoon, where um, a, a pickup truck uh, full of black men and AK-47s um, had been stopped at the side of the road by two white police officers, and, and the men inside had opened fire and killed one of the police officers. Now, these two were accused not of being um, on the scene of the crime, but having brought these men to town to rob a white farmer, um, and were found guilty of murder by common purpose. Six years later, they and the people who committed the murder um, appeared before South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, before the Amnesty Committee, and applied for amnesty. And the men who had committed the murder said, we did it, and it was politically motivated, and this is why. Uh, but these two were telling the truth. They had absolutely nothing to do with this at all. Um, the Amnesty Committee believed everybody's story and granted the men amnesty who had committed the crime but said to these two men, their names are uh, Futsi uh, Mofokeng and Tsukolo Mokwena, we can't give you amnesty because you've committed no crime. Uh, and they remained in prison for another 13 years. Uh, when they left prison, I began working with Futsi. Um, I, well, I, I don't really have time to say why I was so interested in his story. Um, at the time I began working with him, the transcript of the trial proceedings that convicted him of murder was lost. And, and deep into the project, about two years into the project, uh, an audio tape of the trial proceedings was suddenly found, and I raised money to have it transcribed and read it, and was deeply shocked by what I read. 
I mean, we all know that memory is unreliable, but his memory of what happened on that day um, was largely fictitious. Um, and although I couldn't see from the trial transcript that he was definitely involved in the murder, he may well have been, and, and it seemed to me he no longer knew. Um, and that was the stage at which I abandoned the project for two reasons. One is that it seemed the contracts which brought us together had been broken. I was there to tell his story, and now the only story I could tell was against him, and I didn't want to do that. And, and the second is that I would become another in a line of powerful people who did not believe him, and I, I did not want to be in that position. Should be said that after he was convicted, he, he bent his whole being into the project of showing his innocence. Uh, he finished his schooling by correspondence and did law courses to understand the law. Um, during the time he was inside, he wrote over 400 letters telling people what had happened, including to Bishop Tutu, Winnie Mandela, uh, the Secretary General of the ANC, everybody he could find, um, begging people to listen to his story. So I put away the project, but couldn't keep it out of my head and kept nibbling at it and kept returning to it because there were things about his story that, that I wanted to know more about. And, and one of them was, was this. At the time that he went to prison, he was of a group of four boys, in the, young men in their early 20s, very close, uh, very wild. They drank heavily together every weekend. They chased women together every weekend. Um, they, they were always together, very, very, very wild, very rough. And of those four, the other three all, well, two died young, one of AIDS and one in a car accident when he was driving drunk. And the third, although still alive, has lived um, a really tragic, sad, derailed life. And, and Fusi is the odd one out. He, he spent the first two decades of his adult life in prison. Uh, he walked out the most extraordinarily functional, adjusted, together human being. He walked into a town with a 50% unemployment rate, uh, not only found a job in, in the municipality, but scaled the ranks very quickly and is now a senior manager. Uh, he also fell in love with a woman and married her and adopted her two children and, and really took them as his own and, and loved them as his own. He, he seemed an extraordinarily decent and profoundly functional human being. And I was wondering what separated him out from the boys he grew up with. Another interesting feature was his relation to his childhood, which puzzled me. He lived a very, very difficult childhood. He was the son of labor tenants on a farm outside Bethlehem perhaps among the most exploited, marginal people in the country. Um, he was brought up initially by his grandmother, who dropped dead in front of him at the age of when he was six years old, uh, was sent to live in, with an aunt and uncle in Tsukosa in, in Johannesburg. Uh, his aunt was very cruel to him, didn't want him in the house. He eventually escaped from her when he was 16 and went to live with his father in Bethlehem. His father was a very heavy drinker, a violent man, a man who couldn't uh, keep money, uh, Fusi had to leave school because he was too poor, a very difficult childhood. And yet his conception of his childhood is among the most idyllic conceptions of childhood I've ever come across. And it was most profound when I would drive with him out to the landscape in which he grew up, in these farms southwest of Bethlehem, where one could literally feel a feeling of, of transcendence and of spiritual ease come over him when he was in this landscape. Um, and reliving moments in his childhood. He, he was clearly anchored to his past in a very powerful, unusual way. Um, and in fact, would tell me again and again that he was at his very happiest the day before he was arrested. Uh, he held down a job and had money, um, lots of disposable income with which to play and, and buy clothes and be free. Uh, the boys he was with, he was close to and loved. Um, he was in good space. And yet, as I investigated further, partly through the trial record and partly through other sources, I discovered that this conception of his, of, of who he had been the day before he was arrested, was, was also profoundly incorrect. He had, in fact, lost his job at the supermarket six months earlier and was unemployed, um, and no longer remembered that. Um, he had also been chronically ill and had been searching quite desperately for a cure, and nobody could give him a diagnosis. And it seemed to me that he was probably psychosomatically ill um, as a result of a, of a very difficult uh, uh, life. Um, and so a really extraordinary story emerged, which I think 
a kind of rewriting of the soul happens to him in prison. Uh, a really quite radical retrofitting of memory and of self through a quest to prove his innocence. Um, and the tools with which he rewrote himself, or really reinvented himself, um, were, was itself an extraordinary story. It was the Truth Commission. Um, I, I admitted to say that his memory of what happened on this day that he was arrested, uh, in fact, came from the testimony given to the Truth Commission, which was largely fictitious, and which he wrote over that day in 1992. It had become the Truth Commission's truth, it had become his real memory. Um, the other discursive tool he'd used to rewrite himself was just a simple story of, of national liberation, of an oppressed person being freed. Um, and you know, the words, you know, refashioning and self-invention are, are very fashionable. Um, but it took quite a lot of reading until I found one or two scholars who, who really wrote about them in their truly radical form. For instance, Ian Hacking, uh, the philosopher of science, in his book, Rewriting the Soul, on the history of multiple personality disorder. I mean, the idea that a self can be radically, truly discontinuous. Um, uh, a real profound incoherence of self, uh, a capacity in adulthood to, uh, to retrofit memory, um, to develop a moral relation to oneself and the world which simply didn't exist in one's former self. Um, it became for me a profoundly revelatory story um, and a story about healing, about the capacity of an individual to heal himself through fiction. Uh, through self-invention, through forgetting, through self-deceit. Um, it seems such a pr profoundly counterintuitive story to me. You know, deep in our culture we say that to be okay we need to know the truth about ourselves. We need to have a sense of reality, the reality of our pasts. And this seems to be the very opposite. And, and I thought it was not possible to write a book about that. Um, to write really about the almost sacred power of a human being to heal through invention, then I shouldn't bother writing at all. But if that story can't be written, what, what can be written? Um, so that is an, an ethical defense of, of ending up writing a book about somebody which in a sense is profoundly against him or profoundly against his self-conception. Um, and a quick word about what I think that might mean for biography. I mean, it's often said that biography carries in its very structure and its very nature if, fiction of a coherent self, um, of a, an individualist conception of, of what a person is moving coherently through time. Whereas working in biography, I've discovered that in, in this case, the structure of biography, the, the language of biography, can really show the opposite. Um, it's, it can be a very, very powerful vehicle of showing the profound incoherence and discontinuity of self. Um, and I think that we should pay biography that credit. Uh, that it's able to do many, many things. Um, it has a, a flexibility, um, a dexterity, uh, which as a practitioner of biography I found immensely surprising and rewarding. Thanks. Uh, wait to see the book, Jenny. Uh, we're now moving on to our last speaker, uh, Pramila Nadesan, who is... Um, Visiting, she's uh, this year's uh, Fulbright visiting professor uh, in politics and international relations at Pembroke College. Pramila is professor of history at Barnard College in New York. Uh, she's um, also bridged um, many research topics within uh, American history. Her research uh, focuses, uh, ranges from race, gender, social policy to labor activism organizing in US history. She is very famous for the work that she has done on uh, histories of uh, labor, and particularly um, African American uh, women's labor movement. Her most recent book, Household Workers Unite, the untold story of African American women who built a movement, um, <coughs> deals with activism among African-American domestic workers in the 60s and 70s. And she's now moved on to a very different project, which I think echoes um, her South African origin. Now, the biography doesn't say, but Pramila was actually born and partly raised in Durban in South Africa. She's currently working on the biography of um, 
Miriam Makeba, I think that's what she's going to talk about today. And she also collaborates on the We Dream in Black uh, project. She's the president of the National Women's Studies Association. Um, and again, outside of academia, she's, Pramila is much more than an academic. She's also been activist and activist in women workers' uh, rights in the US and an anti-apartheid, a very strong and very young um, anti-apartheid um, activist in the 80s. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say thank you to Katie and to the other organizers for putting this conference together and for giving me the opportunity to participate in the conversation. Um, yeah, I appreciate uh, the questions about problematizing the global South uh, as, as a construct and as a framework. And I'm a US trained historian, so one might ask what I'm doing here at a conference like this and uh, why I'm writing a biography of Miriam McCabe. Uh, and I think part of what I think we ought to do is to not just rewrite the histories of the global south, but, but as you said, to rewrite the histories of the world, right? So it, uh, to begin to bridge what we would call the histories of the global south and the global north, and especially I think in the case of McCabe, to think about the ways in which a quote unquote global south figure, right, can help rethink the narratives that have dominated uh, in US history. So that's partly what I'm going to talk about today. Um, <coughs> so for those of you who don't know, uh, Mary McCabe was a South African musical performer and an activist who was exiled from South Africa in 1959. She went through Paris and London and landed in the United States became a supporter of the civil rights movement, performing alongside Harry Belafonte, um, and um, spoke with activists and organizers, ran benefit concerts, and became deeply involved in the Black Power movement. She was exiled from the US in 1969 and ended up moving to Guinea, where she lived for over a decade. And that was in part because of her marriage to Kwame Ture, uh, who was also known as Stokely Carmichael. Makeba is positioned as a cultural emblem uh, in the struggle against apartheid. She was known across the world as Mama Africa, that was her designation, because of her political engagements, but also because of uh, this kind of cultural construction of her as a quintessential African diasporic figure who symbolized the homeland, the quote unquote authentic African. So using her cultural authority, her exile status, and the performance stage, she raised awareness about the evils of apartheid and facilitated the development of a transnational black power movement and anti-apartheid solidarity movement. She was an outspoken critic of racism in both the US as well as South Africa. She spoke before the UN Special Commission on Apartheid. Um, and she was present and performed at almost every important Pan-African gathering in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, my comments today about her are less about presenting findings or drawing conclusions than really about highlighting some of the questions that animate my work at this moment. I'm still fairly uh, early in my research, so I'm trying to think through some of the larger themes that will inform this biography. And I guess I'm gonna just begin by saying this is my first biography. Uh, and some of the things that I've been grappling with are themes that have come up here today in the talks. I've written two other monographs, both of which are histories of social movements. And as histories of social, as histories of social movements, they're rooted in, a, in, a in the structural position of poor African-American women, both working class and women, right? Uh, as well as the efficacy of grassroots collective mobilization. Right? And so my broader interest um, in this project is about discussing the development of a transnational movement around apartheid and black power. So in launching the McCable Project, one question I have to ask myself is why a biography? Biographies are, by definition, individualistic, right? And we choose individuals because they're intriguing. And Makiba has a, is a fascinating figure. So there are several things that I'm grappling with. Um, 
Does biography reinscribe histories of the global south with a new pantheon of heroes and heroines, one rooted in exceptional lives and extraordinary circumstances? So as has been said before, we don't necessarily want to produce counter histories that replace great white men with great women of color. <laughs> Um, to what degree is my project an individual versus a collective story? And I think more importantly for me, how can we tell a collective struggle through the life of an individual? How do we give people agency? And I think that question of agency is partly what makes a biography compelling to read, even as we illuminate the limitations of historical context. Um, another theme that I'm thinking through is how McCabe's story is central to the development of black internationalism. And by that I mean Pan-Africanism, black power, and the apartheid movement. Brent Edwards urges us to consider how discourses of internationalism travel. And has illuminated the obstacles, the mistranslations, and the uneven social relations that are inherent in the development of a global black politics. McCabe's positionality as a cultural icon, activist, and a woman offer a different lens through which we can view these very dramatic events of the 1960s and 1970s. Because she was exiled, she was both a national and a transnational figure. National because, of course, she was South African first and foremost. Um, and as an exile from South Africa, she was a living example of the perils and pains of settler colonialism. Her designation as Mama Africa challenged the claims of white South Africans as a rightful owners of the land, and this was especially resonant in a moment of decolonization. But she also lived and traveled throughout the world. Her music helped articulate and foster a black diasporic identity pride and opposition to apartheid. In the course of her life, she recorded over 30 original albums, and her music was circulated globally and made uh, the politics of anti-apartheid legible to different racial, ethnic, class, linguistic, and national groups. Her very distinctive sound fused American jazz with, 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 with African rhythms, and she used music as a form of resistance to challenge the erasure of black culture that underpinned the project of apartheid and US racism. One of the questions that I'm thinking through on this theme is the distinction between diasporic and solidarity politics and the relationship between the anti-apartheid construct, black power, and pan-Africanism, right? And so these are all uh, somewhat different. Um, the question of gender is also an important one for me. Despite her centrality to the Pan-African, the anti-apartheid, and the international black power movements, Makeba is, perhaps not surprisingly, absent in the literature. The genealogy of black internationalism is often male-defined, from Du Bois and the Pan-African Congresses in the early 20th century, to the black political and literary flourishing of the interwar years, to the Bandung Conference um, in 1955, to the Black Power Movement of the 1960s. Uh, these are all very male-defined events. Uh, and Michelle Ste as Michelle Stevens describes it, there has been a, quote, persistent, structural, never-ending, never-deviating, masculinist gender politics in the discourse of black internationalism. There is, however, a growing body of academic scholarship, and I'm thinking here about the work of Carol Boyce Davies, Keisha Bland, Eula Taylor, Rhoda Reddick, Dea Gore, Eric McDuffie, and Barbara Lansby, that has examined not only how black internationalism was informed by black masculinity, but how black women have played leadership roles and offer a different political sensibility emerging from their experiences as women. So it's not simply a story of adding women to a narrative that we already have, but how do we then begin to rewrite that narrative? Um, and finally, uh, just a very brief word about archival sources. <laughs> uh, uh, 
and the difficulty of excavating certain kinds of knowledge. And we know this is true, of course, uh, you know, as I said earlier about women's history in general, it's also true of working class history. And Makeba was both. I mean, prior to coming to the United States, she, her mother was a domestic worker. She herself worked as a domestic as well. Uh, at the same time, she was a very public figure. So I actually have an abundance of material about her, newspaper and magazine articles, musical reviews, and two, uh, two autobiographies that she wrote. So I think her story, as it's narrated by her and by others for public consumption, is fairly transparent. What is less clear and harder to grasp is the private and the personal and the disjunctures and overlaps with her public persona. The hidden world, I think, that might help me understand why she made the choices she made, her fears and her desires, and the nature of her personal relationships, and how she understood the rapidly uh, developing events around her. And I guess I'll leave it there. I mean, it's more of a question of, of, of how I can begin to recover and resurrect, but I think it does bring me back to the point I started with, which is really about unearthing the nuances and the complexities of the relationship between the individual and the collective.